quick welcome. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mai, hāri mai. Uh, I'd like to especially welcome uh, Councillor Scott and Councillor McKenzie. Great to have you with us today. Also, we've got obviously Caroline Hart uh, from ECAN. Thanks for come, uh, being with us to speak to us today. Really important. Really interested to hear about the CWMS. Um, Matthew, great to see you here. Media present as always. And also, we've got Lloyd from the Community Board. And I think, oh, apologies if I've missed anyone, trying to look at uh, two screens to make sure we've got everyone. So we'll um, move into the agenda. Um, and we've got a call for apologies. Is there any apologies? Yes, we've got John McDonald from um, Pleasant Point and Janine Maguire from Geraldine Community Boards. Okay, fantastic. And so just uh, a couple of rules, I guess, probably the easiest for councillors um, when we're uh, voting and moving, just raise your hand at the same time because I've got you over two screens. And we'll try where possible, uh, we'll move this in a wee moment, we'll try where possible um, to use the raise your hands but buttons because uh, otherwise I might uh, miss you if you can uh, try and do that. And we'll just work through one by one. Cool, so uh, can we have a mover for the apologies? Uh, Councillor Gilchrist and Councillor Parker. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, to uh, out of the blocks again. Um, uh, all, all those in favour? Aye. Feel free to raise your hand. Thank you, uh, Gary. Um, so we've got identification, uh, oh sorry, public forum, no public forum. Uh, Number four is identification of urgent business. Have we got any urgent business at all? No, not that I can see. Um, uh, matters of a minor nature, is there anything? Uh, Stu, yep. Stu, I can't hear you. No, so unmute. Uh, unmute, mate, but I think you might have just a sound issue on your um, on your device. So I'll let you fix that, but I'm comfortable um, in having a matter of minor nature, and we'll um, just go, go to that um, later on. Sorry, you there, Your Worship? Yes, who's that? Ah, oh, you, Steve. Steve, yeah. Just one matter for minor nature for myself. The, um, rubbish collection. Have some discussion around that. Okay, brilliant. <coughs> Just one point of process, uh, Your Worship. Yep. If someone um, is having problems or needs to comment, if you just go up to the top and the three wee buttons and hit the chat, and if we can keep a live chat going, uh, then you can get some sort of uh, idea of some comment on something. Yeah, cool. And um, oh, John, we'll, we'll follow that chat as well if there's anything. So that's great. Thanks for that. Is IT manager coming in? Yeah. All righty. So we'll continue on. Um, so uh, item number six, dec declaration of conflicts of interest. Any there? No, not that I can see. Um, so then we move to confirmation of minutes. So we've got uh, 7.1, which is minutes of council meeting, 23rd of March. We'll move it for that. Oh, sorry, I can't see. P uh, Councillor Burr. I'll see that. Uh, all those in favour, raise your hand. <coughs> Carried. We'll move straight through. 7.2, minutes of tenders and procurement. Uh, Councillor Wills, another. Councillor O'Reilly. Just a point of order on that last motion. Um, Councillor Bird, I don't think, you, were you present on the 23rd of March? I think you're away. <clears throat> Ooh. You won't be able to uh, move us. That's right, we'll go, go back to that. So someone else that was present. Uh, Councillor Parker, a hand from you. Councillor yeah, Bird. I'm happy, but, but I was under the understanding that, that as long, you, you're all saying it's correct. Okay. Uh, I think that's something that's getting orders to I understand. Yeah, um, Maybe it's just a second, but I'm happy to second. Yeah, okay, that's cool. So just to recollect, did we get a, uh, uh, Joanne, can you, or Joe, sorry, can you jump in? Did we get 
have you got recorded a Sally is seconder? I can't remember who was the person <laughs> in the end there. Talking about the actual council minutes, I had yeah. Peter Burt as the mover, and I've now replaced that with Sally. Thank you. And That's so, good. Yeah, and so we'll just go back. All those in favour regarding that? Aye. Gary, okay, seven point two. So we've got tenders and experiment. Uh, I'm happy to move that as we get a seconder. Uh, Councillor Burt, thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Gary, uh, seven point three. Tenders and experiment meeting. Um, what we'll just try to do is, if we can all just keep our um, sound off where possible, we're just getting a bit of feedback coming through. Um, keep your feedback, and through this process, we'll just raise our hands, hands and that'll be a bit easier. So, 7.3, uh, move and seconder. Oh, sorry, that's a bill, Chris. I see you waving there. <laughs> and uh, Councillor Booth. Nice work. Uh, all those in favour, raise hands. Thank you. Four minutes of tenders uh, committee, 8th of Feb. Oh, sorry, have you got a point there, um, Pete? So just checking, um, were we on the minutes of the 28th of January, Your Worship? We are... The minutes of the tenders and procurement committee, no, 28th no. of no, we're now on 18th of February. Yes, but the ones you've just passed, where Councillor Booth was seconded on the 28th of January, is that what he seconded? Yes. I wasn't present, I don't think. No, that's correct. So uh, we just I wasn't one of them. Yeah, I think yes, so it was. On one. Who's present at that one? Uh, yeah. At that one, uh, Your Worship, uh, yourself, Councillor Burt, Gilchrist, and Parker. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm just looking at the front page. Um, cool, so where did we get to? <laughs> so we just need a second there, I think, to replace Alan. Thank you, Councillor Parker. All those in favour? Carried. Uh, and then we're now on to uh, 7.4, page 23, uh, meeting on the 18th of Feb. Is that where we're at? Uh, who was there present? Yeah. Councillor Burt and... We've got Councillor Parker, perfect. All those in favour? All right. Very, thank you. And then finally, minutes, uh, 7.5 uh, on the third. I'll move that. Cool. I'll see it. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Booth, give me the second. Uh, who else is there? Councilor me. Parker. Yep, perfect. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. All right. Carrie, thank you. Okay, um, who knew confirming minutes was going to be so hard? So we're now <laughs> to um, 8.1, and we've got contracts let uh, from tenders and procurement meeting, and that's on page 31. I'll just give you run a moment to get there, if you're not already. Cool, and so it's just following the contract. Uh, just re recommended that the report be received. Q and A. Someone hit the move. Councillor Parker, thank you. Can I have a second to that? Uh, Councillor Lyon, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Kerry, thank you. Look, so, um, just if, if there is anyone against, sorry, can you just um, highlight? Uh, but I'm sure there won't be in this instance. So now we move to eight point two. Um, and we've got ECAM presentations, uh, Carrie, uh, water management strategy, and great to have Caroline with us, and also great again to have the um, two councillors from our region. It's fantastic for, for you to join us. Um, obviously, you're uh, on there as well, Mark. Did you want to speak to this, or just hand straight to Caroline? Mark, uh, just happy to hand it on to Caroline. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, we're all yours. Very good. Well, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, meet with you today via Zoom. Um, I'm the, um, my name's Caroline Hart. I'm the Senior Strategy Manager at Environment Canterbury, who has the responsibility for the uh, freshwater portfolio um, at Environment Canterbury, which includes um, 
the strategic advice around how we work with the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, which is the briefing I'm um, going to take the opportunity to give you today. Um, the, the background, the briefing that I've got for you is um, very much just as a background uh, presentation. So for some of you, or many of you, perhaps this may be quite familiar. Um, I'm very happy to come back at a subsequent occasion and um, go into a little more detail or dive into some areas that you have a particular interest, um, if that is um, useful for the Council. Uh, I have got um, a PowerPoint slide which I'll load up in a moment, um, but I'd like to suggest that as we go through, if there's uh, points of clarification, um, please, uh, please ask along the way. Um, I'm thinking with the, with the PowerPoint, I'll, I'll pause at a few um, key points, I think, just to check in that uh, Council is comfortable with the conversation and, and what's being conveyed, and then look forward to perhaps having more of a, um, a discussion towards the end, if, if that's what you would like, and I'll take the, uh, the, the PowerPoint down off the slide so that we can um, see one another again. Is there, is there any... Um, Questions or, or comments on that before I load up the, the PowerPoint? Okay, um, I may need some confirmation um, from perhaps your worship that uh, you're seeing the, the right version of the slide. No um, now, can you confirm for me whether you are seeing a single image slide? With the title Canterbury Water Management Strategy. I've got that, and then you've got the um, uh, the slides down the side there. So, yep, now we've got we're all good to go, I think. I mean, okay. The next are, slide. You, are you uh, only seeing um, a single slide, or are you seeing um, some additional material down the side? Some present. Yeah. yeah, the next slide as well, but that's probably fine. I'm pretty sure we can work with that. Okay, does that work if I switch there? Are you getting a full slide now? Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, very good. Let's get underway. So uh, the overview I'm wanting to give you today is on the Canterbury Water Management Strategy itself, which is a strategy that was developed uh, over approximately 10 years ago and was adopted by the Canterbury Mural Forum that was responding to what at the time had been in the preceding decade, the period of where there had been severe drought, uh, droughts and a highly contested conversation around how fresh water should be managed across Canterbury. Uh, there were some strategic water studies that were initiated um, prior to the development of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy to um, help in, its, in, in the development of the strategy itself. And it's pro probably worth noting um, that in contrast to today, there was no operative freshwater management planning framework in place around Canterbury to, to manage for, um, for fresh water. When the Merrill Forum um, adopted this uh, strategy for the region as a non-statutory uh, strategy to guide how we will manage freshwater management collectively, um, there was a partnership between um, Environment Canterbury and the territorial authorities, but there were some other important partnerships there, primarily um, Naitahu, who, while not a signatory to the strategy, are, are a key uh, working with uh, Papata Puranunga and Tirunanga on Naitahu has actually been very critical to the success of the strategy, and working with community and other organisations who have an interest in our fresh water management. So while the uh, Canterbury Water Management Strategy itself is a document um, of the Merrill Forum, we're recognising there's a much wider uh, range of agencies and Runanga that we're partnering with in its um, implementation. Uh, the slide that you now have in front of you has the uh, vision that has been articulated in the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. I'll just read that through. Um, to enable the present and future generations to gain the greatest social, economic, recreational and cultural benefits from our water resources with an environmentally sustainable framework. And that vision has um, been driving the Canterbury Water Management Strategy for the past 10 years. In terms of giving uh, some more expression to that, if you like, the strategy has, includes a range of target areas. So there are 10 
uh, target areas within the Canterbury Water Management Strategy itself. They are all listed um, on the slide that is in front of you now. I'm not proposing to read through all of them. I'll let, I'll let you um, do that as we look at this particular slide. But I think the key thing to note here is that the target areas cover ac across all of those values that were articulated in the vision statement that the Canterbury Water Management Strategy is aiming for. One of the other key uh, kind of planks, if you like, to the, to the Canterbury Water Management Strategy is also this concept of wanting to progress on all of these targets simultaneously. And the term parallel development was coined in the strategy itself to recognise that these values are all important um, across community while they're diverse. They're all important in terms of how we manage fresh water. And there was not a prioritisation within these particular target areas, but rather an aspiration that they be progressed in parallel. That has proven to be um, quite challenging in the last decade, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with some, some of the tensions that we've had in terms of progressing the implementation of the strategy across these 10 areas. Um, each of these uh, 10 target areas um, have time-bound goals. And the slide that you have in front of you now um, is illustrating the goals that were articulated in the time periods as they were in the original uh, publishing of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. So there were goals articulated for 2010, 2015, 2020, and then out to 2040. Uh, it's worth noting that up, and, up until very recently, those were the extent of the goals. We didn't have any medium term goals articulated across those um, target areas. So Caroline, we've just got a question from uh, Councillor O'Reilly. Do you want to take the questions as you go? Absolutely, thank you. Councillor O'Reilly, would you like to go ahead, mate? You there, Patty? Just, uh, what's up? Hey, yeah, go for it, mate. Who, me? No, yeah. no, I, I, no, I was playing. Oh, you hit your Sorry. Head. That's all right. No, no. <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to get the thumb up. It's worked. No, yeah, keep thanks. Done for now. Um, thanks, Caroline. I will leave it. Put Sorry, there. Caroline. No, that's, that's quite all right. Um, I know what to do now. Very good. Um, so this slide is illustrating where the originally published strategy had goals articulated each of those time periods. Uh, as we were approaching 2020, uh, the Mural Forum um, recognised that actually we had a gap in terms of what were our medium term objectives for 2025 and 2030. And in 2018, uh, the Mural Forum commissioned um, some advice, uh, requested Environment Canterbury to lead the development of advice, but working with territorial authorities to develop goals for 2025 and 2030 across all 10 target areas. Um, at this point here, I'd just like to acknowledge in particular um, the role that Tracy Tierney and her team played in supporting Environment Canterbury and in the work that we were doing in developing these goals. This was about a, a year-long project, working with territorial authorities and with community to develop the, the goals for 25 and 2030. And these were confirmed in May uh, 2019. So we now have a, a fully populated set, if you like, of goals at five yearly intervals out to 2040. And the work that was done in developing the 25 and 2030 goals, the 2040 goals were left intact, so they themselves weren't reviewed. Uh, they've been uh, left as sort of the, the outward long-term stretch goals that were originally established through the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. Uh, there were a couple of key additional pieces of advice that the Merrill Forum sought when they endorsed the goals for 2025 and 2030 in May of last year. 
I'll just touch on the key topics and I'll pick these up a little later in the presentation. So the mural forum in, in approving these goals were very mindful about the fact that they didn't simply want to have a set of aspirational statements that kind of hung there, but not being implemented. So they asked for some further advice to be developed to uh, establish well, what were the key mechanisms around leadership and accountability that were needed to implement these goals? What, what was the resourcing and funding requirements? Um, they asked for some advice around monitoring, reporting and review, and also to ensure that we had a broad base of understanding and support for the Canterbury Water Management Strategy to ensure that the ongoing implementation would be successful. And I'll touch on the details of those a little later on the slide. Um, before I move off the slide, I just want to speak to the lower illustrations there. Um, they are the uh, reporting framework that is in place around identifying how we're progressing against targets. So every two years, uh, there is a, a targets progress report pu published. Um, we do have the most recent published being 2019, and we'll be looking to publish an, another report in 2021. And they are looking across um, all of the, the goals across each of the target areas at each time period. So it's quite a detailed report uh, to give a sense on how the implementation of the strategy is progressing. Uh, now, before I go on to the next slide, I wonder if I might pause there and just see if there's any comment or questions. And thanks from anyone there. Just um, jump in if you've got something to uh, ask Caroline. No, it looks like we're all good at this stage. Thank you. Thank okay. You. So you should now have in front of you um, a map of the Canterbury region. As, as a key part um, of implementing the Canterbury Water Management Strategy has been the establishment of zone committees throughout the region. This was undertaken within a year of, of the strategy being adopted by the Mural Forum. And the, these zone committees are, are joint zone committees. So we have the um, Urari, Tamuka, Opehi and Porirora Zone Committee, which is probably closely affiliated to your council. And these uh, zone committees have been um, instrumental in engaging communities uh, to help develop solutions to locally water, local water management issues. And I think that's been a, a key aspect of how the approach to implementing the, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy is that we've gone down into zone and a catchment level understanding of the water resource and its use and the communities that are utilising that resource. And the zone committees have been instrumental in that. Uh, those committees have been working to develop uh, zone implementation programmes and many have also gone on to develop a zone implementation program agenda, which have helped to advise what regulatory provisions should be put in place to uh, manage fresh water in their particular zone. Just want to highlight here that the uh, zone committees are joint committees of uh, Environment Canterbury and the respective um, territorial authority in, in the zone, so Timaru uh, uh, District Council in this case. And they make recommendations to council, but they're not in a position of making any binding decisions. Really the only uh, area that committees have uh, discretion to make decision making is in um, allocating some of the immediate steps biodiversity funding that is provided through Environment Canterbury. Other than that, they are um, an advisory and recommending body through to uh, Timaru District Council and Environment Canterbury. Uh, you as a territorial authority are providing the secretarial support to, to, the, to, these, to, the, your, to your zone committee and Environment Canterbury in turn is providing sort of the facilitation expertise and zone delivery support for some of the projects that they're looking to implement. And I think one of your own councillors, Councillor Gilchrist, has recently been in, moved out of that role and into her, her current role as a, as a councillor. Just wanted to um, pick up on a, a comment that was 
was made earlier in the presentation, but just wanting to make the emphasis here around the importance, the importance of the collaborative approach um, that's been undertaken in the implementing of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. This has been, um, at the time when we were initially embarking on, on the strategy itself, was quite an innovative and unique approach to fresh water management in New Zealand and has proven to be um, put Canterbury essentially in a leadership position in terms of management of fresh water. But the diagram that you've got there on the slide in front of you is really just illustrating the diversity uh, of groups and agencies and communities and interests who are part of the work that's happening around managing uh, fresh water in Canterbury. So we have the regional council and the territorial authorities with Naitahu sort of central to uh, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy with the zone committees as the key mechanism, I think for um, engaging through from the local government perspective out to communities. But then you'll see the diversity of agencies there through from health boards, NGOs, um, education research institutes, uh, the rural and industry groups. Um, there's a whole diversity of parties here that are involved in, in the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. I just want to give you a, a, a sense of uh, how we've been travelling in terms of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy implementation over the last decade. Uh, the little diagram that you have in front of you is probably familiar, the strategy, planning, implementation, monitoring and review cycle. And to date, uh, you'll see the more emphasised arrows in strategy and planning. Really just trying to emphasise here where the focus has been, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily for uh, zone committees, but also wider communities and implementing the strategy. So as I mentioned earlier, there uh, hadn't been at the, at the beginning of the strategy any regional planning framework in place. And so this was uh, an area of intense focus for zone committees and communities in, in getting the provisions that uh, under the Resource Management Act enabled the management of freshwater resources. So a very heavy emphasis on that uh, strategy and planning phase, if you like, of the cycle. Just to draw that out a little more, um, in particular, and, and uh, the OTOP committee has been most recently involved in the development of um, the Zone Implementation Programme Agenda advice, which has now informed the development of aspects of Plan Change 7, which are going through um, submissions and, and shortly hearings, um, COVID situation submitting, um, to, to put those provisions in place. So just on the, 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 the planning approach for freshwater management, um, while the, when the Canterbury Water Management Strategy was initially um, adopted, there, there wasn't any direction uh, from central government around how freshwater should be managed. Since then, however, there has been a series of national policy statements um, rolled out and other guidance and more to come. And the strategy itself has been used and has retained its currency, if you like, because it's been the instrument that Canterbury has used to respond to the national direction through um, national policy statements, for example. As a result of this, we do now have the freshwater framework in place. We've got a number of sub-regional uh, plans um, throughout the region that reflect uh, more of the local community aspirations for freshwater management. And it means that Canterbury is at the, at the forefront, actually, and we're very well positioned uh, for the next round of uh, policy proposals, which they understand uh, will still be coming. We've seen draft proposals in terms of the essential freshwater program, but we've been leading in the space around freshwater management and actually been quite important role in informing central government um, how they may approach freshwater management, which is, in part being reflected through some of the draft proposals. Is there, is there any comment on that before I go on to the next set of slides? 
Caroline, can I say something? Peter. Yeah. Your worship. Go for it, Peter. Yeah, you Peter has got rules or anything. Oh, sorry, Peter, you're just freezing, mate. I assume everyone's getting the same. Um, just mm. try. Can you hear? Yep, go now. I think he, yeah, he's freezing at his end. I might have to give him a quick call. No worries, so, thanks. We'll okay. carry on. Is there any other questions that we can come back to? Um, get us a in a minute. No, that's cool, Caroline. We can continue on, and once we get um, Peter sorted, we can bring him back in. Thank you. Uh, so while we've spent the last few slides talking about the enormous effort that's gone into establishing the statutory planning framework, I do also want to emphasise that there has been, over the last 10 years, a consistent effort to work on the non-statutory actions um, with communities across the region. So there have been a whole range of practical projects that have been um, delivered throughout, throughout communities. One particular example I've already mentioned is the uh, immediate steps funding in terms of biodiversity. There's been over $10 million in biodiversity projects throughout um, Canterbury that has been put in place since the strategy was enacted. But this is actually a, a really important part of the story in terms of managing for fresh water not simply relying on a regulatory instrument, but also working with our non-statutory um, actions and opportunities with community to improve uh, water quality and, and ensure flow. Uh, turning back to the, to the uh, little diagram there around where we are in the, in the cycle, if you like, the future focus, um, and the arrows that we've now got emphasised is around the implementation and, and monitoring phase. It's very much now that we have the, the planning framework in place largely throughout the region, not entirely, but we've, we've all but there, is actually really turning attention to the implementation, um, not only of the, of the plans themselves, but all of the non-statutory actions that are required to ensure the, we achieve the outcomes that we're looking for in terms of um, fresh water. This was uh, a key focus for the Merrill Forum and, and in part while they asked for the development of the goals for 2025 and 2030, which um, I think almost exclusively are focused around non-statutory actions uh, that Environment Canterbury uh, territorial authorities and, and communities can undertake to support the goals of the strategy. I think uh, what is uh, perhaps a slight tension here is that we are yet to see the announcements from central government on the essential freshwater package or the action plan for healthy waterways um, and what that might mean in terms of the requirements for another look at the planning framework across the region. So we're not sure um, what that will mean, depending on the details of what central government release. So that may uh, push us back a little into the planning phase, but that aside, uh, the Mural Forum and others are very keen, communities are very keen to look at how we move to an implementation phase and also emphasise the importance of monitoring. I think that was some of the key advice that we got uh, back through from the engagement when we were identifying the 2025 and 2030 goals was the need for um, some really robust outcome-based monitoring rather than some of the activity-based reporting that you will have seen in the targets progress support that Environment Canterbury has been producing every two years. So recognising that the, the monitoring requirements are very much a key challenge. Uh, that's something that Environment Canterbury will primarily be leading on, but we'll be working, we'll need to work with um, yourselves and others in that. And actually it's a, a, a challenge for the country. I think the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment pointed out some of the challenges that's, that we have um, at a national level in terms of the understanding of our environment and how we're monitoring progress against it. 
just pause there to see if there's any uh, questions or comments before I go into a little more detail about some of the additional work the Mural Forums commissioned. You still got quite the hooks of it. There must be saving, uh, saving everything to the to the end. Okay, very good. I'll press on. Um, now you may recall I mentioned uh, four key areas that the mural forum had asked um, for additional advice on. One of them was monitoring, which I've just touched on very briefly. The second one was around the resourcing and funding that would be required to implement uh, the 2025 and 2030 goals. So <clears throat> on that front, uh, the Mural Forum has asked for the development of a, what we've called a regional work programme that would outline well, what is the activities or actions that would need to be undertaken in order to ensure that we were delivering on the goals that we've set for ourselves. And they asked for a focus initially on the 2025 goals. Now, originally they had commissioned their advice to go back to them in May. Um, I'll just touch on some amendments to that time frame given the um, disruption of this COVID situation. Um, but that was really their intent. The Mural Forum's intent was asking for advice so that we as a as local government had a sound understanding around what would be needed in order to achieve the goals that we had set for ourselves. I think it's important to note here that the, when the regional work program eventually does uh, land with the mayoral forum, that we will be asking them to endorse that program. It, however, is uh, an action that they will be taking as a, as a, as a leadership group and as the uh, owners of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, but the decisions that the mayoral forum will be taking are not binding on uh, local government. So it will be up to you and your council to make your own decisions with your uh, communities and ratepayers around where you would like uh, funding allocated as you uh, move through your annual plan and long-term plan. So the advice that will be eventually coming out of the mural forum is, is advisory. Um, and we are working to deliver that in time so that it will be ready for, for you as you uh, get into the deliberations around your long-term plan, but very much see that this is uh, an individual council decision around where the uh, funding will be allocated. Uh, just in terms of the regional work program, uh, we this just at a high level strategically for councillors, there's three key components to that program. Um, really wanting to recognise the work that is already underway um, by territorial authorities towards these 2025 goals. So that was one of the really heartening things that we learned in the work that we were doing in this space, is how much activity is actually already underway getting towards these 2025 goals. Um, the next uh, B there is identifying areas where further investment might be desirable. And we thought there would be also be a good opportunity to identify whether there are any regional themes that we're seeing emerging across Canterbury that might be um, interesting or helpful for uh, Environment Canterbury and Territorial Authorities to be aware of when you're making your own funding decisions. Um, and just on that, I just yeah, would like to acknowledge and thank Ashley Harper and his team who, again, they've made a, a key contribution to the work that we've been doing um, on this regional work programme including uh, contributing quite a um, comprehensive stock take analysis uh, from your council that's really much helped the development of this regional work program. Um, so just to give you a sense of some of the themes that have been coming through to date, um, the drinking water actions by and large have been well progressed. And so this is obviously a high priority of the councils and, and we are looking in a good space across Canterbury in terms of our progress towards the 2025 goals. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, we're finding that uh, additional effort is likely needed in some of those uh, environmental areas, ecosystem health, wetlands, drylands and biodiversity. Um, and equally, and this is more of an environment Canterbury space, Outcomes focused um, environmental monitoring frameworks um, and data is very much needed to support our understanding of, of the strategy and its implementation. 
And again, this is probably uh, not news to you, but the other key thing that's been emerging is just a recognition of the scale and complexity of the task of, of managing fresh, fresh water and looking to see whether there's opportunities where we can partner or work together on that, given the quite significant challenge that we do have. Um, now, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're anticipating that central government announcements um, on their essential fresh water package were previously due in the middle of this year. Um, I'm not able to give you any uh, detailed updates about um, timing or content of that, given um, the quite significant disruption we've had as a, as a nation in terms of um, COVID-19. Uh, in terms of the briefing, we were, we were scheduled to provide this uh, advice back to the mayoral forum in their meeting of May of this year. I'm still looking uh, to work with the mayoral forum to see um, they have had a shift in priority, as you would expect, um, given the COVID situation, and when might be a good opportunity to bring this advice to them. So I, I don't have a revised date for you at this point. Uh, I guess the, the next steps really then is ensuring that we have um, those recommendations through the mayoral forum because while some of the priorities are changing, um, we recognise that the, the timeframes for the work that councils are undertaking on long term things haven't changed. So we do want to get that advice out um, ahead of those conversations getting, um, getting underway. Is there any questions on that? Otherwise, I'll move to the final slide. Okay. I might, I might press on. I'm not hearing comments. Um, one of the other areas that uh, the Mural Forum had also asked us advice on in respect of leadership and accountability was, was the role of zone committees themselves. Um, in commissioning this advice, uh, the Mayoral Forum were very uh, definite and very clear about uh, the fact that they absolutely endorsed the collaborative uh, management approach to freshwater management and endorsed the Zone Committee's role in, in facilitating that and the conversations and connections that they have with, with communities. So in asking for some advice around where the next generation of design committees actually, if you want to think of it in that way, will be focused, but wasn't in any way seeking to step back from wanting to continue to work collaboratively with communities on freshwater management. So they have asked for some advice around, well, what would be, what would be the focus of design committees in the next decade? There's been an enormous focus on um, um, establishing uh, good relationship and connection with communities and then enormous effort in terms of that, some of that planning work. But what would be the next 10 years worth of focus? Some of the functions that are, are popping through, I've got on the slide there, the importance of community engagement, um, the importance of working um, at the local level with the likes of catchment group and others to achieve and progress some of these um, objectives for freshwater management. Still seeing a role there for the, for the ZIPs and the ZIP agenda. But uh, D is probably one you're quite interested in in terms of uh, where, are the, where are the resources coming from for um, some of the quite big challenges that we, we still have in front of us and how might we expand access to resources that we, we now have. And the monitoring question, um, which has been quite at the forefront of conversations today. Uh, the second order question from that with a using the um, convention of form follows function. Um, just having some consideration of how we appoint members, what skills and capabilities we're looking for in our zone committee um, community members, how we might better support our running our representatives, and what might be the role of, if you like, an action plan for zone committees to help focus their, um, focus their energy and attention. I'll, um, I'll pause there. I'm happy to leave the slides up or I can release them so that we can um, have a conversation unless anyone would like to refer to a particular slide. Thanks, Caroline. I think we'll, um, in that case, we'll pull the slides down and then we can 
a better visual. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. <laughs> really informative, and um, I expect some questions in a minute, or otherwise I'll put you on the spot. Uh, okay. There's uh, a few people with uh, very invested in this, and just like to reiterate, uh, you know, from the Canterbury Mural Forum, um, we are as uh, you know, the greater region still very invested in, it, in this, and it really is, you know, what does phase two look like? And um, pretty exciting, really. I think, um, you know, those that have been involved, such as Richard over the years uh, with OTOP, you know, there's been so much work going into it. And I, you know, I really believe we are, you know, leading the way throughout the country. So all those that have been involved have put in so much work. So um, really exciting um, stage two, if you, or phase two, if you like. So I'll go to Councillor Burt, and then um, open it up to anyone after that. Thanks. Hi, uh, Carolyn. Uh, just, I was just going to, yeah, I was just going to make a point around uh, the the ten point plan of, of which obviously drinking water is is one of them. And um, uh, given this environment that we have, this new the new regulations and the new regulator, um, how has that affected the strategy? And has it changed any priorities under the CWMS? And I suppose as an adjunct to that, of course, that that review covered um, also covered. Uh, wastewater and stormwater um, has that in any way shaped um, some of uh, some of the decision making, or has it has the CWMS uh, flexible enough to adapt to that? Thank you. Um, when we were developing the uh, 2025 goals, the the Three Waters Review was very much a live conversation at a national level. Uh, so we were very conscious of that as we were developing the detailed actions and that we needed and the, and the goal articulation across each of those areas. So uh, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy goals that have been developed for 2025 are in step with the direction that central government is heading. And, and the, the strategy was itself already, but we were particularly mindful and we worked very closely with the territorial authorities on this because this is an area more um, where you know, quite a lot of effort will be required from the territorial authorities in terms of the functions in this space. So we had a, a close working relationship with the TAs on this. The goals that we've articulated in the, in the goal statements for 2025, um, I believe are in line with the direction of travel from central government. It may be that, depending on the direction central government continue to provide, we may need to go faster, but we are, we're heading in the right direction. Um, in terms of whether there's any inconsistency, the strategy itself and the goals that are articulated under it are non-statutory uh, goals, so they can be adapted and amended as needed as the national context changes around us, as it is. So just a follow up, uh, if, if I could, Your Worship. So I think you probably answered my question then around PC7, because um, where that lands is um, potentially going to have um, some major ramifications, especially in that PA area. And I, was, uh, I presume then that the, the plan is nimble enough to, to take that into consideration. Yes, and it has been uh, notified prior you know, prior to any central government uh, policy announcements, they've yet to be announced. Um, so we we'll continue on with PC7 for the moment. We'll obviously be looking at the implications of any central government announcements and what that might have in terms of the planning framework and its implementation. Thank you. <laughs> Chief. Thanks, Councillor Burt. Uh, any other questions there? Um, Councillor Chris, and then we'll go to um, Mr. Harper. Hi there. Can you hear me all right? I've got my ears in. Um, hi, Caroline. Nice to see you. It's not really a question. It's just just a comment that now I'm involved in the, with the OTOP Zone Committee in a completely different way to before, just to, re to kind of reiterate how important it's going to be for the Zone Committees to have a really clear sense of purpose. Mm. Um, as things change, I think you've got groups of really willing and enthusiastic people and there's a real danger that um, if zone committees aren't given really good kind of active things to do, um, that people will lose interest, which I think would be a real shame. So no question, just a comment. Yeah, thank you. And that's a um, very astute observation actually, and in, and in part why we are looking at the functions of zone committees. 
Um, at the moment, the terms of reference for all of the committees throughout the region are around the development of a zone implementation program and its implementation and monitoring of that, and, and as if we were required. And for many committees, they have, they have done the lion's share of that job and they are asking themselves and us, well, what next? Mm. So this is quite a timely opportunity to, as you say, give some real sense of uh, clarity around purpose so we can yeah. maintain the energy and momentum. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Uh, thank you, Your Worship and councillors. Um, Caroline, you heard uh, Councillor Burt mention PC7. I'm not sure everybody understands that, and maybe you could give a quick explanation and also tell us when the hearings are going to be, because we're in the, the final submissions on submission stage, so we're quite well advanced in that process. If you just yes. tell us how that's going to round out. And right. the second question, and then I can cease talking, is that Locally, uh, the OPAHI minimum flow regime was subject to adaptive management. We had an OFRAG committee and our whole community thought that worked fantastically well, but that's not part of ECAN's thinking in PC7. Maybe you could, could help us understand some of the rationale behind that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll do my best, Ashley. I may need to come back to you with some of those um, more detailed planning questions because it's not a not something I'm as close to um, as perhaps some of my colleagues are. Um, in terms of the timing, um, we are very much looking at how we might manage uh, hearings in an environment where people are not able to meet other than virtually. And the chair of our hearings panel is living in Australia um, with closed borders. So we've got some, um, we've been doing some thinking in house, we haven't yet landed on a, um, a new set of dates or process for that, but um, very much need to kind of kind of clarify that for ourselves actually, and then come out to out to communities and to yourselves around what's next. So we're still figuring out what's next actually, because the plans that we had uh, for hearings to begin in May are very much uh, not possible under the current sort of uh, alert level four sort of COVID situation restrictions. Um, in terms of your question around the overhead mid flow, um, I'm probably not best placed to answer that. I'm not sure if um, Peter Scott may have a view here, but I'm happy to um, come back with some details for your council because I, it's a, it's an it's a important question and um, there's some important technical components to this. So I wouldn't like to mislead you with an incorrect answer. Thank you. I think we've only got. Um Councillor Scott, are you able to talk to us or are you just listening in? Can you hear me, yes. Nigel? Yeah, loud and clear, mate. Go for it. Yeah, Nigel, I think um, there are two really, really astute questions from Ashley. At the moment, I think um, uh, our planning, if you if you read uh, the submission, uh, Section 42A report on Plan Change 7, uh, Section A, which is uh, a big read, um, which I have just done, it is pretty in depth in terms of uh, where it's at. I've got some concerns myself and have expressed them at council as to how we go forward with this because uh, although we can do it virtually, I think uh, we'll lose a massive opportunity if we can't do the face-to-face -face stuff. So we've got some caution around that. And the other caution that we have, of course, uh, as a councillor is, is around the essential fresh water reforms. And you'll be up with that, um, your council be up that with as much as, as, as I am. I mean, they've got some really big implications on those for the country and whether this government is willing to bring that to bear uh, in the face of what we've got is a question I think they're asking themselves too. So both both things, um, both things are, um, uh, our PC7 is probably not up there, but Central Fresh Waters may be. So we'll see where that gets to. Ashley's other question around OFRAG. Um, uh, the view I think from the planners and don't don't uh, it's not a hundred uh, from my but my view from that is that those conditions and those um, uh, and the way OFRAD uh, operated may be better under a consenting process than being written into a plan. Uh, so I think there's some the the it haven't been chucked out. Uh, uh, there will be some consideration of that uh, during the hearing process. Is my understanding. Back to you, Caroline. Thank you. <laughs> Is there, a, is there any other questions, Your Worship? Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, and thanks for that, um, Councillor Scott. Um, go for it. 
Hi, I'm not sure if you can hear me okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo what Barbara said um, about the zone committees. I think it's absolutely critical that we have um, facilitators. We may need to have different sorts of facilitators than we've had in the past with this planning and strategy phase uh, to the implementation phase. Um, so I think, yeah, it's very important to actually consider about, you know, what people from, um, this is sort of for, for Carolyn, maybe make a note, um, just, uh, yeah, maybe review the, the facilitators and their skill sets and, and whether we need to change that for the future. Yeah. Thank you. I've noted that. Cool. Thanks, Councillor. Um, any other questions there? I don't see any uh, hands raised. I'm just going to refer... Uh, Councillor Lyon, you're okay? Uh, oh, I agree on. with uh, Barbara's suggestion of uh, you know, keeping the zone committee with, with, with things and goals to, to achieve. You know, and it is so important because the only thing we look at is from the mirror forum down, it's multi-faceted and multi-level. We've got four levels, you know, if you count ECAN, it's five levels. And the TEO, as you get down to six, well, it's quite a con convoluted sort of a system. So. We've got to keep ourselves somehow focused and it's important, as Barb said, to keep those locals involved in their areas and it's really important to keep the catchment groups working within the areas and doing the things that have been suggested and achieved by themselves because that's the key to have people wanting to do things locally. So no, no, I'm very comfortable with the way the conversation's gone on. Just that, yeah. yeah. Right, thank you. Cool, thanks um, Richard. Um, now Caroline, have you got anything to, to you want to finish up with or? Oh, no, but really just to say thank you very much for the for the opportunity and if you would um, like through the presentations in the future, it's obviously at quite a dynamic stage at the moment with um, awaiting a range of central government proposals in terms of the essential fresh water, the uh, indigenous biodiversity, climate change, highly productive land. There's a raft of <laughs> policy in the wings that um, once we've, we're a little clearer on that and very happy to come back and talk about what that might mean for the for the strategy, if that's helpful. Yeah, very much so. We'd love to have you along again. Um, yeah, it is a bit of a wait and see and, and um, you know, maybe New Zealand first will um, throw their two cents in as well and uh, something, yeah, something, <laughs> something or something may not come out the other end. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, interesting times. Now, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Uh, we just need to uh, move the report. Can I just have a... Uh, Councillor Gilchrist, um, Councillor Burt, thank you. All those in favour, uh, raise Aye. your hand. Cool, and thank you so much, Caroline. I really appreciate that. And thanks, um, Councillor McKenzie and um, Councillor Scott for taking the time to be involved. Really appreciate that. Thanks, Caroline. Yeah. And uh, if you would like, I can uh, provide the uh, PowerPoint yeah. presentation through if that's useful. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Right, thank you. You're, you're okay if I'm to depart now? Yeah, by all means. Thank you. All right, thank you for your time. Yes. Um, I'm leaving too, if that's all right. Yeah, no, no worries. Thanks, um, Elizabeth. Appreciate that. All righty, that's great. So we are. Councillor Paddington. Just checking whether you can hear me now. Yes. Or I need a teenager again. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was clear. Great to have you with us. Um, now we are on to uh, 8.3, so annual plan, uh, so we've got a few involved. I'll pass on to Pat Stoner and, and Mark to lead, potentially, is it, or I'll leave that with you guys. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I'm happy to just give a quick overview. So this is our uh, report for the eight months to the end of February. So. Uh, obviously, this is all pre-COVID and gives an overview of our um, financial uh, progress, our project progress, and uh, our performance framework progress. So, the, the covering reports that it covers out in quite a bit of detail, as well as giving a, you know, a bit of, of, of guidance around, um, or a bit of early comment around the, the COVID situation and where uh, we might look to go uh, in the future. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll take the report as read, but we're happy to answer any questions or for officers to answer any questions on any comments coming through that. 
or for any other other report writers to uh, provide some uh, comment, you're welcome to to kick in as well. Yeah, cool. Well, let's go to uh, anyone else involved with the report. Is there any commentary before we uh, get to questions? I think I can see you all. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, I take the report as read. Um, yeah, important to realise this is in a pre-COVID um, world that we did this. It's interesting that in a month since, life has changed quite considerably. At the end of um, February, we were tracking at a $9 million surplus for the year, up slightly of about 400000 on where we expected to be. So we were tracking along quite nicely. Um, waste, it's, waste income was up quite a bit. Um, you know, personal costs were down a wee bit against budget, and operational costs were down as well. So well, the things were looking um, quite good. In terms of where we head to from here, we're in the midst of working with unit managers and doing a re-forecast with them. Um, it's quite hard in some respects to do a re-forecast, um, just from the fact um, if assumptions are changing uh, daily or weekly. As you know, we've been in this for two weeks and you know we could be in this for you know, a reasonable amount of time at level two or level three, we just, we just don't know. So the world as we have changed, uh, as we know it has changed quite a bit. So we're working with uh, you know, a big unit, whole, a unit, unit managers around that and just trying to ascertain how that affects them. Um, some have a better idea than others at this stage, um, and some of it's like some some of them won't actually get affected until April. So, thanks, uh, David. Uh, Counts. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, we'll go to Mr. Harper and then go back to um, to Bede. Thanks. Uh, Your Worship, this is the first time that uh, the program delivery unit of Lily and myself have uh, had input to these uh, eight month and and 12 and then four months reports. And you'll see at, uh, at paragraph 11 onwards, we have made some comment. Uh, we've, we've, we've made an assessment that 70% of projects uh, will be completed by year end. That was our estimate back at the end of uh, February and reinforce what David said, that has changed and we are preparing some advice for council and that will change almost every week now about how we, uh, how we might get to year end because it is going to be very different. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thanks to take your point. Uh, it's going to be fluid and ever changing. Um, uh, B. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. You look, to the point David's making, I guess broadly you'd say there's two parts to the re-forecast. One is the model and uh, preparing the model, and he is working with uh, unit managers and others to get the model. The key thing is, what are the, what, what do we populate that model with in terms of the data? And that's where the real uncertainty at present arises. And uh, it is, as the other, others have indicated, it is something of a, a shifting ground, and it will be uh, uh, some weeks before we get some real clarity over that. Nonetheless, uh, we are working, we're, we're developing a model, and then the, the real test is what we put into the model, both in terms of assumptions and in terms of the actual data. And I guess that is what the yourself and the councillors uh, in the community will be particularly interested in. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Burt and then Councillor Paddington. Yeah, just a quick question. I was just looking at that um, bar funding. Is that $2 million unfavourable uh, timing around money expected back from NZTA for Rangitata? No, it's really just a mix, really, of, of the work programme where they're up to. Um, so they do have a guaranteed uh, just over $2 million sub, uh, funding for that project, but some of it relates to their normal work program as well. Thank you. Maybe I could just uh, round that out a little bit. For example, LED uh, street lighting councils approved a, a big um, push on that to get it finished on the major arterials, which have much bigger lanterns and so on. That material hasn't arrived from China for all sorts of reasons. And so that is likely to be delayed, especially now that we've got uh, COVID, but that's never a straight line. So that unfavorable relates to a straight line, whereas the, it, that spend, especially in roading, is, is very uh, seasonal and therefore um, it's, it's not an issue, it's just how it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pete, did you have a comment on that as well before we go to Stu? 
Uh, yeah, I, I think just to clarify the, the question to uh, Councillor Burt, uh, it is, and um, both Ashley and David, uh, while it might be a mix of factors, it is generally a timing issue about the funding assistance claim relating to work undertaken previously, if either David or uh, Ashley could actually just confirm that point. That's correct. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Uh, Councillor Pennington. Yeah, look, realise the world's changed. David or Bede, in the early days of some of that modelling, where are we going to lose income from? Because I see on stuff, uh, Auckland City Council have just let 1,100 temps and contractors go. So are we paying the likes of contractors that aren't doing their contracts at the moment? You know, lawn mowing, those sorts of things. Are, are we in for those bills? Because looking forward, obviously, our income's going to drop and costs are going to go up. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Harper. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I could give a very good example of that. Uh, and I, uh, in New Zealand, have stopped flying in to the airport. We all know that it's on the public record. Therefore, our revenue for landing charges and terminal fees has evaporated. Car parking revenue has evaporated, and we've taken steps to minimise our contract costs at the airport. And I. Uh, because we're in, in public meeting, I can't go into too much detail, but you, you can be assured that for a, for a little operation like the airport, we have basically put into hibernation, cut all the costs that we can, but recognise that there are a number of fixed costs like depreciation and so on, but we're trying to do all those things and I understand it and, and Eric can perhaps provide some more informed comment about the infrastructure stuff, but, but everybody is making sure that um, we, we're minimising expense and, and trying to not minimise revenue. Thanks. Um, actually, uh, Eric, did you want to add to any of that? Yeah, jump in. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll just follow on from that. It, it, um, that was a great example. We're doing that with all our contracts at the moment. Um, quite a few are still essential services, especially around the three waters and transport, which will carry on. Um, to a more limited degree. A lot of our contracts do have measure and value um, components, so we won't be paying for work that's not done. Um, there are fixed price components that we are looking through contracts at the moment and just making sure that um, we're paying an appropriate amount for work that is either in stasis, um, is paused, um, is suspended within the contract, and we'll pick up hopefully when we're allowed to coming out of a level four. Um, so that's what we're working through the contracts at the moment and the agreements. Yeah, cool. Thanks, uh, Eric. And look, we do have other examples of uh, people like to the lump sum contracts whereby I think that sits probably in parks and we can um, share and jump in here as well if you like. But I think, um, you know, a little bit different as far as being able to uh, turn that off as such. But please uh, offer commentary if you, if you wish. Uh, so, no, uh, sorry, Beadle or Shira, if you wanted to jump in, feel free. Uh, yeah, look, uh, through you, Your Worship, and Councillor Fittington, that's right. Some contracts, uh, um, as Ashley and Eric have described, are uh, what you might call unit rates, or where if the work is not delivered, we don't pay. We do have some others, which are what are called lump sum uh, contracts, where in actual fact, we pay for a level of service. And so it doesn't, the contractor, uh, whether they, um, we don't pay for say 12 cuts per year in some areas, we pay for them to maintain a level of service. And those contracts we do need to uh, look and review what are the terms in terms of where they stand at the moment. But as it presently stands, my understanding is on some of those during this four week period on those lump sum contracts, it has not uh, been reviewed right at the moment. And we've got to be quite uh, careful in terms of observing the terms of those contracts. But in a number of areas, wherever we can cut the costs, we, we certainly have done so. Did you want to add Yeah, um, my interpretation of what Auckland City Council is doing is 
not so much cutting contracts, but cutting contract doors. So where they are filling uh, roles within their council with temporary contractors, my understanding reading that article is that is where they are making their cuts um, rather than actually looking at contracts, which obviously have a lot of legal implications that we will have to go through the terms. We also have some of the smaller ones that we've got a bit of a responsibility to our community to make sure that they are there to deliver the service at the end of this. And if uh, that requires us to keep paying in the short term to make sure that we have got options to deliver critical services at the end, then that's our responsibility as well. Yeah, key point, and you know, there is a lot of employment um, that sits under the council within these contractors. So, um, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, in a few weeks' time, there might be a brighter, brighter world we can uh, wake up to. So, uh, let's stay optimistic. Um, now, is there any other uh, comment there? Any other questions around the eight month report? It's all pretty easy. No, sorry, I feel like I'm going cross-eyed uh, looking at these um, screens. Alrighty, so we just need uh, someone to move the report then. Uh, two recommendations, I think, but we'll just put the package them together. The mover, Councillor Parkett, thank you. Councillor Wills, thank you. Uh, all those in favour. <laughs> Was that you, Councillor Booth? No. <laughs> uh, did you hear my... But <laughs> I will carry that. I did, you might have heard my dog, did you? Yeah. Uh, there's no one coming here. If you're trying to break those COVID rules. You can't come to our house. My German Shepherd will get you. Yeah. Or are, are, you, you? are you coping with your, uh, my door's always open? <laughs> <laughs> um, moving right along. Uh, so we're now on to 8.4 and we've got the local uh, governance statement and that's on page 134. Uh, so thank you, Your Worship. So I can give a quick overview of this. So essentially this is just a bit of an information document that we're required to do after each election. So um, this gives an overview of um, all of council services, what we do. Um, some, of the, some of our consultation information about how we do that and how, how council can uh, liaise with the community. So it's a, it's a legislative requirement that we try and make it um, as friendly to the community as possible and spread, spread it as widely as possible so that uh, people can learn about uh, what the council does. Yeah, awesome. Any questions, uh, potentially any newer members around that report? Um, Wonderful photo too, nice front page, uh, front page. Nice and glossy, got a lot of glossy report. Um, so let's have a, a mover for that. Uh, Councillor Gilchrist and Councillor Oliver, all those in front. Can, can I ask a question? Certainly yeah, can. Yep. Sorry, I just, I just had a comment when I, when I read the statement. And it was just, if you go to page 138, and it's the Who Are We, the Timaru District Profile, I just, when I read that, I wondered if we should, well, I thought it would be good if we mentioned mana whenua in there. We talk about it being the food bowl, and it's been the food bowl, it's been a food bowl for a very long time before European agriculture, and I just thought that mentioning mana whenua in that, in that Who Are We District Profile would be a good idea if it's possible for things to be added. Uh, yep, so I mean we can add that in. There is a, there is a section on our relationship yep. uh, to yeah. Aotahu as well that, um, that has been slightly tweaked. Um, we went back to um, ACL and, and, and they tweaked that slightly. Um, but we can add that in there as well. It's not a problem. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear everyone's opinions about that, but and I, I did I have seen that there is the section, the relationship with Naitahu, but I just thought that in the introduction and the Timaru district profile, that that seems to me, that seems to be something we don't want to miss out. Yeah, cool, valid, valid point. Yep, happy to endorse that myself. Uh, so, uh, any other questions? I think we're fine. Uh, Councillor Gilchrist is leading the charge with technology and be able to raise a hand for, via tech. So that's good. Um, <laughs> we're having some wins. 
Uh, so we'll take Councillor Gilchrist as the mover. Are you happy with that? Oh, Thank you. Oh. Um, <laughs> Patty's found the button. Your oh. Worship, can I just raise something? I'm just trying to find it. Um, I think it was regarding dist district promotions and how that's now being moved across. Yep. I don't think it's reflected correctly, but I, can't, I think it's on page 28 in this. Um, Yeah, it's page 28. The district promotions component called RAP Tourism. So are we still running, running that way or is that still relevant? Yeah, look, I think that's a point to note and I'm sure we'll... Um, accurate. Yeah, now we can tweak that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Thank Longer. you. Anything, uh, anything else there? So we'll go back to Mover and Councillor Oliver was a seconder. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Raise your hands. Uh, cool. So we go now to uh, number nine. We've got no urgent business. Uh, moving on to number ten, uh, matters of minor nature. We'll start with Steve only because I know and heard what his was about. And then um, Councillor Puddington's will be the mystery that we're all excited to wait for. So we'll talk about rubbish uh, collection first. Uh, Councillor Wills, if you can jump on that, mate. Oh, thank you, Worship. It's mainly to do around the greens, the collection of green bins and the public information that was released around that. Uh, what I've found is, um, and well, I've been traveling around in my bubble and or at supermarket, and also a number of phone calls I've received as well. A number of people have raised some concerns around the, um, the fact that they feel that they don't or cannot use their green bin at the moment because of the information that's released, even though I understand it and, and read the article. But it's just to give people some comfort that they can still use their green bins because Especially amongst our elderly people and people who enjoy getting out in the garden, the fact that we are locked down in our house and uh, sort of within our, our sort of confines of our property for a lot of the people, to get out and about and do a bit of gardening and be able to use a green bin still because of peace and rest release and a bit of community well-being. So I just want to know if we need to sort of frame up some further correspondence to be released out there to the public saying, look, go ahead, use green bins. You know, as much as you can, minimise the amount that you're putting into it. But let's be very mindful of the fact that there's a lot of people in our community that, for them and this alone, the ability to get out and do some physical activity, get in the garden is a, a real big thing for their mental well-being and also a bit of a release to get outside of the indoors. So I just want to make sure that we do cover that off well so the messaging is absolutely correct, that we can get people to get out there and still get involved in doing what they do to keep themselves in a really good space as well. So that's what I wanted to highlight. So thank you for that, Your Worship. Thanks. We'll go to Eric and then we'll go to questions from um, Councillor Gilchrist and Councillor um, Paddington. But there is genuine reasons, and I'm sure Eric can allude to yeah. those. And I guess, you know, in regard to, you know, yeah, green waste, hey, you know, you use some of your long clippings as compost. Um, most people have a large section of store. I know it's not perfect, but load your trailer up or try and store you know, some of your green waste until a later date. So there's some pretty genuine reasons. So Eric, I'll pass on to you. Yeah, I'll just, just clarify that. Yeah, I think um, we can definitely help clarify that. The um, intention is one, not, not to try to confuse people. One, we're collecting all our bins as normal. Um, so that's still carrying on. If people need to use the green waste, um, they can. Um, we didn't want to create any more stress in people's lives, um, but we also did need to make sure um, that we are focused on our essential service of rubbish um, and trying to limit um, potential impact on staff and picking um, bins up, but also in the rubbish as well. Um, so we did ask people just to try to conserve where they can, um, if they can store it on their property, um, as everything is going to the rubbish at the moment. So all recycling, all green waste is going into the landfill um, at the moment. So we're just trying to ask people who can just to back off and store it until we come out of um, level four, um, and then we can continue our organic um, um, recycling. Um, we will, if there is, if there's not clarity around that messaging, um, uh, we'll follow that up. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Eric. Look, and, um, you know, Matthew, if you're listening to the key messages, um, you know, if people can still minimise their waste, that would be really uh, helpful because it is all, you know, going to um, going to landfill and it does cause some issues with the landfill. So, you know, there's really genuine reasons. So we just need to get that uh, message across to the public. Uh, we're not trying to make life hard for you, um, but we're also looking after, you know, our people and our contractors 
and keeping them safe. So, you know, the normal recycling and sorting, that's not going on. So that's a really important message for us to get out there. And I appreciate your help with that, Matthew. And now we'll go to uh, Councillor Gilchrist and then Councillor Piddington. Yeah, just about the about the compost a comment really. Um, I just see this as a really good opportunity to be teaching people how to make compost, and that we've got a great bunch of followers on the Facebook page, and um, all of us have the ability to share that as well. And that maybe somehow we could do some kind of a teach yourself how to make compost video. Um, I've just turned into a complete compost freak now. I'm composting anything that might break down. And um, maybe we could encourage other people to do that as well, let people know why. You know, that their bins will still be collected, but it's going to go in the landfill. It's not great in the landfill. If you can keep it at home, you might even be able to turn it into some kind of treasure you can use in your garden. So just, just wondering if maybe comms could do something clever with that, because they're clever people. Oh, I look forward to you doing it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, but I have trouble making compost and holding my phone to film it. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough hands. Just on that, Nigel, after the big snow, they allowed um, free green waste dumping the week after. Once we came out of the lockdown, perhaps we should offer that. Therefore, those that do have the facility to store the green waste on their property, if we allow them to use their trailer for a week once we come out of lockdown to drop off the green waste free, um, it might alleviate people worried about how many weeks it'll take to fill their bins afterwards. Yes, yeah, certainly, thanks. And uh, Eric, have you got a comment on that? Yeah, just following on that, that, that we are exploring those avenues as well. I think um, recognizing if we're asking people to hold it, and we have done it in the past. Yeah, brilliant. Look, and I think this is key that we're, you know, listening to the issues that are out there and, and we will look to resolve it as, as best we can. So uh, thanks for that, Eric. Uh, any other questions in regard to that? No, and uh, Deputy Mayor Wills, you're comfortable with that? Um, hold on, we'll unmute you, mate. No, really comfortable with that. I think it's just to appease a number of people who got concerns, you know, it has been raised. So uh, I think we can address it in a way that Eric is um, going to bring forward through communication. So no, comfortable with that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, if no other questions, we'll um, go on to the mystery matter of minor nature, uh, Councillor Piddington. Oh, no, look, just wanted an update on uh, the project, the Theatre Royal Heritage Hub type thing. While we're in, does it just sit? What, where are we at with those sorts of projects? Yeah, look, and um, I'll get Donna to jump in, but I, um, you know, one of the things Donna and I talked about, we were during a workshop, I think, um, last week, and obviously with the COVID situation, we're a little bit behind, so it's really important, I think, that we all get in the same room and just get up to date again and, and, and uh, have a measured approach to where that's at. So, Donna, uh, did you want to add anything? To that, but I think that's the plan in the next wee while to try and try and have a um, bit of a, a discussion around that. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So we're um, so definitely able to offer that workshop to um, have a really good look at um, where we're up to with the project. Um, just in terms of the main focus at the moment with the project is in that sort of procurement space. So um, you know that we've recently, or before Christmas, we appointed external project manager. We had also gone out to the first stage of the architect's appointment um, and came up with a shortlist from that process. So um, prior to COVID, we went out with the second stage for that appointment. Um, so that was already in train when um, COVID hit. So we're in a procurement process at the moment. Um, so this is where we get our design but team on board to start work on the concept design. Um, so once the design team is in place, then the question will become how do we approach the concept design, particularly if we if there are restrictions on travel and so forth. Um, that's what we'll need to be working through as a project team um, for the project because the, the concept design phase will take about three months and we really need the concept design to um, come back and really sort of put a 
quantity survey across the costings um, to go out and be able to really get going with the fundraising because we want to have something in our hand that we can go out and um, show the public, um, show the community um, and get that get that part of the project happening. So um, there are a few other work streams also in, um, happening in parallel with the procurement, but the big focus at the moment is really on getting the, um, the design team in place. Just one question around that, Donna. When you talk about the design team, I know there's some debate around the back of the Theatre Royal, whether it should be bold or retained. And also there's still that question over earthquake strengthening. Where does that come in this project? And timing wise? Yeah, so, um, so the original project scope was to um, replace or at least substantially replace the back of house facilities which is kind of the dressing room facilities um, and that is still within the scope of the project um, it will be looked at by the design team um, and in terms of the earthquake strengthening so at the moment uh, it's not an earthquake prone building we had an assessment carried out in 2014 um, and it was there were some local areas within the the facility that were below 34% but there's subsequently been some strengthening work done so we need to get an updated um, structural engineers report to see where the MBS now sits but I'm um, you know it's expected that will be over the legal requirements and then it's just a question for the council in terms of whether they want to um, continue to improve that um, percentage MBS for the building as part of the project inevitably as a result of the, a lot of the work that we're doing, such as replacing the back of house and work on the stage house, um, there will be um, opportunity there to improve the, the MBS further, um, and that will need to be considered as part of the project as to what we're aiming for there. Cool, oh, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go to Councillor Bird and then Councillor Booth. Yeah, just a quick, um, in terms of that strategy you mentioned around the fundraising, um, obviously that's something we're going to <coughs> revisit, um, uh, given that new environment, we, we, when we re-enter our new normal outside uh, the COVID lockdown, uh, what does that mean in terms of, uh, of the community's ability to fundraise and how that's going to look? Um, and of course we had uh, some discussion around the fact that it's uh, potentially one of those ones because of how far down the track it is, um, that it could be one of the shovel readings that we can um, really put uh, uh, forward to, uh, you know, central government to say, hey, this is what we should be looking at investing in and uh, getting a, a, an amazing outcome, but also um, generating that money and that conduit um, through central government to get that money into our economy. Yeah, certainly. So that will be considered as, as it's being considered as part of the strategy. Um, and I think there are other also um, avenues for funding for the project in terms of, um, you know, governance, 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 government sources, the lotteries, etc. So it's not all, um, you know, in terms of the local community. Uh, yeah. There are there are a number of different areas that we're looking at for um, potential fundraising opportunities. So awesome. Thank you. Uh, one thing that normally uh, goes through uh, most recessions and depression is uh, depressions is uh, alcohol sales still stay relatively high and also gambling. So lotteries funding and gaming machine funding probably won't necessarily go away through this time. So there will be sources, but I think uh, to your point, uh, we will have to look at this and I guess there's going to be opportunities if we do free up some of our um, uh, key projects through funding from central government, some of that funding uh, may be able to be re-looked at and allocated to um, some of these other projects where you know we might have some issues around being able to get that uh, local funding and, and fundraising as such. So I think a lot of those things we're going to have to re-look at, so um, busy time ahead. Um, so, sorry, Donna, go for it. Oh, yeah, I think with that it's sort of just a little bit of a, uh, so they've come out with the shovel ready opportunity at the moment. I think, you know, what are the next sort of tranches, I guess, in terms of government, are there going to be other changes within the current funding streams, etc.? Are there going to be further opportunities there? I think for us it's about sort of being ready and uh, being on the ready in terms of being able to take advantage of those opportunities. So, um, you know, getting not moving on with the concept plan and getting that, um, you know, progressing the project as far as we can um, and be ready to take whatever opportunities um, are there, really. 
Yeah, no, agreed. I think this is um, yeah, changing world, and I think this is just uh, the first uh, crack at the funding, and there's probably more to follow. So we'll wait and see what's around the corner and be um, ready and able. Uh, so any other uh, uh, Councillor Pennington, you happy with that at this stage? Oh, sorry, the Councillor Booth. I'll go to you first, and then we'll. Yeah, I was just going to uh, listening to Donna. Uh, you know, considering it's a civic facility, you know, nothing less than one hundred percent of MBS would be satisfactory. It has to be at least one hundred percent if you're going to do anything. So I guess you're not really going to know that until you've got through to the uh, obviously the concept stage, and then you've done the QS work, um, and I guess then you'll you'll be getting a bit of an idea. That's all I've just had to say. Yeah, so I think we need to, I mean, obviously there's a legal um, requirement uh, in terms of what's the minimum legal requirement, but then there's also what we might want to do as a building owner and lots of different approaches have been taken with different projects depending on the nature of the project. Um, become sort of a commercial decision for a lot of commercial landlords in terms of what they want to lift it to, to you know, to make sure because it comes an issue of value. For us, like you said, we've got uh, community facility, it was an IL3 facility because of um, the uh, importance level 3 facility because number of people that would congregate in there at any point in time so that's all relevant for us so we've had a structural report which has given recommendations about the type of work we'd want to do for example to lift it to 85% um, what areas where we might want to focus on lifting it to 100% etc so we need to um, take that further and say, okay, so what does that look like in terms of the project? What does that look like in terms of costs, etc.? So, um, and be able to bring that back to the council so you can make some decisions around that. Yeah, I think that's key, and, and it'll be um, for you to bring back to us to make a uh, consideration. And I guess we've got to just got to be careful with our approach to all of this. We've got lots of community halls that are never going to meet 100% uh, um, of uh, any uh, building code, so uh, MBS. So, uh, you know, if we're going to have that approach for one, do we have to have an approach for all? So we've got to be really balanced, I think, with our decisions uh, in and around this. And we're never likely to invest in some of those community halls and get them up to full um, earthquake uh, strengthening code. So, um, yeah, uh, Councillor Pennington. Yeah, just, uh, Donna, what proportion of the 23.2 million was earmarked for community funding? Um, so for the theatre project, there was a million dollars of external funding, i.e. fundraising um, anticipated. For the um, heritage project, there was um, between a one, and one and three million dollars of external funding. So it's been um, budgeted based on three million dollars of external funding fundraising. Thanks. Cool, thank you. Everyone comfortable with that uh, discussion? Not missing any hands. Oh, sorry. Councillor O'Reilly, apologies, and you've you've um, hit the tick button as well. My apologies. Go for it. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd just like to back Donna and the crew going forward. You know, you know, this has been a project without lingering in the past, but it's been something that's been hanging there. We, you know, we've got to keep driving forward with this, and don't let's not sit back. Let's, as the new catchphrase, be shovel ready and. And um, you know, I just fully support her and, and, and the rest of the crew and uh, let's, let's get this amenity up and running in the, ne in the, in the near future. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Booth, is your um, ability to make shovel handles, are you able to do that? Because we're going to need a lot of shovel. Do anything at the stick factory. <laughs> um. I know where, where to get them. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. Yeah, he'll sell ice to Eskimos. Uh, moving forward, thanks for that comment, uh, Councillor O'Reilly, and I think that's that we've um, got to let the, these guys crack on and do some work. Um, look, uh, I think everyone's comfortable with that. Uh, Councillor Paddington, you're all right there, so I'm just making sure I didn't miss anyone. Um, so moving forward, um, no public items for consideration. Look, and just before we um, move to public excluded, I thought it was fitting uh, for one of us in this Zoom room, it is going to be their last uh, council meeting. Uh, and so I think there's an opportune time. And unfortunately, uh, Sharon, we are not in the council chamber because I think that would be more fitting. It's um, probably rare that uh, we have to uh, thank you through this uh, way for your service. And I think, and I might be slightly uh, incorrect, but I think it's around 
eight or nine years or something like that. Yeah, is that about right? Yeah. So look, um, and I'll, I'll uh, put it to the um, other councillors and SLT to say a few words in a moment. But look, we really do appreciate um, your work. And uh, I've got to say, I really respect you. You're a very uh, strong uh, SLT member. And I, I really respect that and I, I love that about you. Um, I really appreciate what you've done. And look, my working with you with CBD strategy and some of those other things, I you know find you very, very professional and I, I really think you're going to be missed. And uh, yeah, I, 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 it's a real shame to see you go, but also we wish you the best um, and Brian for your future. I know I can understand uh, wanting to spend more time after some of the things you've been through. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that I know you've been involved with. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovate in, innovation that's happened within uh, your team, uh, such as the libraries, you know, short stories, those sort of things. I know you've been heavily involved with uh, the 150th uh, anniversary, uh, also the shot put event. And, and look, I, I've only been here a couple of years, so there's some others that will probably be able to uh, add a lot more. But we really uh, genuinely thank you and um, all the best uh, from Easter and, uh, and beyond. And I'll just like to open it to the floor because I'm sure um, Councillor Lyon and, and Councillor Wills will have something to say, to say if uh, not others. So thank you. Uh, yeah, Councillor Lyon. Oh, thank you, Worship. Yeah, Sharon, uh, look, thank you for your enthusiasm, you know, over the years and, uh, and, and the knowledge you've brought to the building. You know, it's been a, a, a you know, wonderful experience for us all, you know, watching you develop and the things you've brought through. On a personal level, I was so looking forward to being your chairman. And of course, here we are now. Uh, we had a short time together, Sharon. So thank you for that time together. And uh, I, I echo Nigel's um, uh, point that look, all the best in the future. And thank you for the things you've done on behalf of our community and really have a, have a good future. And thank you very much. Nigel, you're on mute. I'll go. Can you hear me, Sharon? Yes. Um, I, don't, I want to say thank you. Um, over the last four years, you've been great. You've been kind. You've been welcoming. You've shared your expertise. You helped me with the social, uh, the youth, the youth um, council. Um, your door has always been open, and um, I really appreciate everything that um, you've shared with me, taught me, guided me with. Um, You've been a really good um, senior leader management to have there um, and to um, ask questions and you've always replied and I really appreciate that. And I hope that you and my favourite vet have a very nice um, year ahead. I'll, I'll miss you both. Thanks, Sally. Sorry, um, Councillor Wills, I've muted myself before. Go for it, mate. Yeah, go for it, Steve. Lost for words. Are you there? Yeah, go for it, mate. Oh, thanks very much, Your Worship. Um, Sharon, what can I say? The princess. Um, I remember, and I say that tongue in cheek because uh, those who've been around for the last six years, um, it was a nickname that we gave Sharon as a result of a, um, a beauty pageant competition that we held in the Scenic Reserve, mostly going back some 30 years ago that she won, and we carried that theme on into the council, and uh, we've had many fun times with that enjoying a Christmas dinner where she got presented with her crown and various other things. So, um, Sharon, look, just on a real personal level, it's saying I've been uh, the chair with you, with the community service group for the past six years. And if there's one person that has a real passion for this community, the honesty and the integrity, and then whatever you've got involved with, you really put the community at the forefront of all your decision-making process. You know, I've respected that, and it hasn't been an easy road for you, especially in those early days when Seabay first opened up and had the slippery tiles and everything else. You know, you were front and centre, trying to manage everything moving forward. And um, what I've seen over the years is that you're an absolute pleasure, you're professional in everything you do, and it's been a real joy to be able to work alongside with you, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. And yes, you did right um, on the other side that, um, you know, there is opportunity as one door closes, another one opens, and um, for yourself and Brian to move forward and um, enjoy to see what the future holds for you. I'm really looking forward to, you know, seeing where that goes. But once again, from my point of view as a community chair, 
thank you so very much for your time and effort. And if you're if you're actually around in the uh, and because we're coming out of the meeting town the council, I was going to shout your wee bubbles for the special occasion. But um, on this occasion, we have to save it for another time. I've even got my shorts on for you. Well done, Jim. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Peter. Uh, Sharon, uh, yeah, going right back, um, some of the key things that um, I've had a lot to do with is obviously that Seabay and, and um, everything that's made that really successful all the way through. Um, and, 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 I, and I always remember um, having to be, uh, you bring in myself and Wilsey and his hit team to try and work out uh, how we were going to get these, these coaches in uh, to uh, fill the gaps and actually have access to the pool and all that sort of thing. And that, that was some, some interesting discussions, to say the least, um, but well managed and with good outcomes. Um, the key things, I think, though, are safer communities, always a, a, a really good uh, environment, so many stakeholders across that, and managing that and all the different expectations. Uh, but the key one was obviously around that restorative justice. Um, you know, uh, that was, um, you know, pure magic in terms of the staff that you had there, the support you gave them. Um, and allowing them to uh, have the flexibility to, to really push the envelope in those early days and everything. And then, um, and also, I suppose, in some ways, um, uh, being uh, always being, I suppose, being targeted as the hit person to come in and, and actually um, uh, serve some of those people up who were in there that um, instead of feeling sorry for what they'd done, just sorry for themselves that they ended up in that forum. But uh, you, uh, you led that all the way through, and it was very, very much appreciated. It had some great. Uh, value to the community, uh, and that's probably one of the one of the, uh, uh, I would say one of your highlights, especially with the girls that that um, now moving on from there. So um, thanks for your work, thanks for the time and everything uh, that you've put in there, and uh, I'm sure we'll be catching up in due course um, uh, in in one of the local establishments when we we move out of this COVID um, environment we're in. Thanks very much. Thanks, Pete. Was, I've got some hands up, but that might have been from the last one. I'm not sure. Um, yes, but uh, go for it. And then we'll go to uh, Patty. Thanks. Hi, Sharon. Good luck. Going to miss you around the place. It's been really nice. Thanks for being so friendly and welccoming. And I remember so what you said to me. What you the, said first, to me. the first time that... Um, I met you, you said, I hope I, haven't, I hope I haven't wasted my vote. And so I'm going to try and make you proud and make sure that you haven't. So good luck. Thank you. Uh, Petty? Yeah, hi. Yeah, Sharon, um, just, you know, just basically summing up what Sally had said, you know, I thank you for the, the guidance that you gave, you know, me. It didn't matter what time of, of the day I could ring, I always seemed to be able to talk to you. So. It was, um, and, and for your guidance and, and, and lots of lots of things that's happened in, in, in and around uh, council. So I wish you and your family the best and uh, hope everything goes well for you. Cheers. Thank you. I'm, I'm absolutely humbled. I um, just want to correct one thing Councillor Will said. <laughs> I've never been in a beauty contest in my life and would never. Um, it's quite ironic though because the fundraising contest that I was part of, uh, I was working for Thomas Cook at the time and my boss said, you do it or you're unemployed. So I became the round table princess figurehead while we were trying to raise money to create the lake at Centennial Park. So it was always quite fitting that I've ended my career managing Centennial Park. So. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, Steve. Um, look, I appreciate everything you've all said. Uh, it's been quite a ride. And, um, you know, I absolutely love working for this community. My career has taken me around New Zealand with senior political roles. Um, and I always insisted that I would be based in Timor. And so I've, you know, done a lot of things where my roles were Wellington or Auckland based, but I always maintained Timor as my base because this is home, this is my community, and this is what I'm passionate about. But it is time to rest, it's time to take a break after 27 years in senior leadership roles. And Brian and I are going to do a lot of traffic when they're finally allowed. Um, but before then, we will probably drink a lot of gin. 
So mm -hmm. thank you, everybody. Uh, look, thank you. And if there's no, thanks, Sharon. And if there's no other SLT, I'll just hold it, uh, pass over to Bede if that's okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Your Worship. And so, yeah, Sharon and Bede, it's a, it's a really sad day because uh, I think we've all enjoyed uh, your candor, your insights. And for those of you that have, you know, that have worked closely with Sharon or even been the uh, been involved at, at, a, at a sort of a more remote level, what you find with Sharon is no issue was ever too big or too small. Uh, and it was focused around what worked for the community and the user experience. And for so many people, I think that if they really had uh, really understood that, they'd know the massive contribution that Sharon has made to this community. And uh, what a rare blend of someone who could take both a community and a commercial focus. Because actually, Sharon, one of the things you did so well was that you were able to blend what was good for the community, but do it in a way that was really cost effective for our community. And it's enabled a lot of services and activities to be delivered. We wish you and Brian all the best. You should certainly are going to be missed. And as the French would say, I guess it's sort of wah, because we don't want to say goodbye. We hope to see you around. Take care and travel well. Thanks. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Pete. Um, look, we'll uh, keep moving on. Um, Steve didn't cry, so that's um, good. Shows he's on uh, the road to recovery. Uh, we're just going to um, now move to exclusion of the public. So can I have a mover for that? Uh, Councillor Parker, Councillor Gilchrist. Cheers. See you next time. All those in favour. Thanks, Matthew. Appreciate that. Thank you.